this is the key actors know. Israel sinned again, and God strengthens a man named Eglon. Well, that's a, you know, again, sometimes you go through the Bible, you look for names for your children, or some you just pass right over. <laughs> Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, who is this man, and what is he doing? Well, Moab, if you remember, and you, you read about the Ammonites here, Moab and Ammon are the, were the two sons of Lot. If you go all the way back, these nations, Moab and Ammon, they are actually distant, distant relatives of Israel. But they became ungodly nations. They were not God's chosen people. One unique detail about the Moabites that, are, that we need to take note of. So you remember the context. God has sent Israel into Canaan, and he's told Israel, you need to destroy all these nations. Well, Moab is not one of the nations. Moab actually lived outside of Canaan. And God said, Israel, even though they're your enemies, you are to leave them alone and let them live in their land. So it's a little different scenario. What you have here is not people in the land that Israel was commissioned to get rid of. You have people that Israel was supposed to leave alone that have now invaded the land. Still a similar scenario, but a little different. And so Eglon, king of Moab, he gets the Ammonites. And he gets the Amalekites. The Amalekites are descendants of Esau. So what you have here is you have distant, distant, distant relatives, actually, of Israel that's oppressing Israel at this point. They come in. They defeat Israel. They take possession of this place called the City of the Palms. And they enslave Israel for 18 years to Eglon. Now, a couple things to notice here. Eglon is the king of Moab. And this will become relevant in a minute. But his name likely means like a bull or a calf or a little calf. We're going to find out why it's important to think about Eglon as a little calf as we go through this. City of Palms, by the way, just so you know, likely refers to the city of Jericho or the area around Jericho. Now, why is Jericho important? Jericho was the very first site that when Israel came into Canaan that they conquered through the power of God, right? You remember? They walked around, and the walls came tumbling down. You know the old Bible story? Blew the trumpet. If, in fact, the city of Palms that has been captured by Eglon is the old side of Jericho, what you have here actually is Israel losing ground. One of the greatest cities that God gave them to destroy has now been re-inhabited by their enemies. You see, sin always causes us to lose ground, doesn't it? When we rebel against God, we always lose ground. And so you have this army that's come in. They've invaded Israel, and God's allowed them to do it. He's strengthened them to do it, and they've taken over what was previously territory won in victory by Israel. Now, again, kind of in the repetitive fashion of the good judges, Israel sins, God raises up an enemy to oppress them. They cry out to God. And God raises up a deliverer to help them. Now read with me in verse 15. Verse 15. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length and bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence. And all his attendants went out from his presence. And he who came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And he who said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from his seat. And he who reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade. And the fat closed over the blade. For he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch, 
and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. Mm -hmm. Application point number one, do not be embarrassed by your Old Testament. Amen. That's right. Ehud, the son of Gareth. Who is this man? He's the man that God raised up. He's the son of Gareth. He's a Benjamite. So he's from the tribe of Benjamin. Interesting little fact, the name Benjamin means so you've been from Benjamin's out there. It means son of my right hand. So the right hand was considered the strong hand. Benjamin means son of my right hand. So you have a man who is left-handed of the tribe of Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. So you have a son of my right hand who's left-handed. The phrase here bound in his the phrase here, left-handed. So the thing about Hebrew is they have a lot of wordplay, a lot of euphemisms that don't come through in English. Literally in Hebrew, it says that he's bound in his right hand. That's a euphemism, meaning that he's left-handed. And he's called a savior. He who is not called a judge, even though he's presented as a judge, he's actually called a deliverer or a savior. He whose name, by the way, is, is, is sort of a sentence. It means, it means a question. Ehud's name means, where is the majesty? Where is the splendor? So, taking all this together, you've got a man in a time of oppression of Israel, when Israel's enslaved, his name itself means the splendor is gone. There's no majesty. He's a left-handed man bound in his right hand. Now, what that means, what does that mean? Some have said it meant he was ambidextrous, so he was good in his right, he was good in his left. That's actually probably true. Some have taken it to mean that his right hand was lame. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's the case. But what actually could be the case was actually a military strategy that sometimes to strengthen warriors and fighters, young men would actually have their right hand bound for a time so they would be forced to use their left hand so that they would become strong both in their right and their left hand. They'd be able to war and battle not only in a way that was doubly effective, but in a way that was unexpected. In any case, this man is a unique man, and he is the Savior that's raised up for Israel. And this man, Ehud, begins to work and to fashion a dagger. Now we read here that he begins to make a dagger. He made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. I don't, have, I don't want to get into all, I don't want to bore you with a lot of details. But the word there that says about a cubit, actually, just, just you can take my word for this and just ignore it. Actually, it's probably less than a cubit. It's probably about two thirds of a cubit. So what you have here is you have a dagger that's maybe about a foot or a little less in length. So not a full-on sword. This is meant to be concealed. It's meant to be bound under his clothes. It's meant to smuggle it in. Now you think about this man, Ehud. He's a unique man with a unique weapon and a unique purpose. We read here that God raised up Ehud in verse 15. You see, God has prepared Ehud, and Ehud has prepared the dagger. Now, Ehud is the man that's bringing the tribute from Israel. So here's the situation. Eglon, king of Moab, has enslaved Israel, and he's exacting tribute or tax from them. This tribute probably was in the form of a lot of produce and vegetables, things that they had grain and all sorts of this. They've been tax heavy. They're required to bring this. Ehud is the man that's leading this procession to bring all of this to Eglon. Ehud knows he's making this trip. Maybe he's made the trip before. And we read here that Eglon, what, what kind of a man is he? He's a very fat man. Ehud is conniving. Ehud is strategic. He crafts a custom-made dagger for a custom-made purpose at a custom-made time. So what we read here, the day comes for this delegation to come and bring their tribute to Eglon. This fat, gluttonous, wicked king. He's sitting in his summer cool roof chamber, taking it easy. And they come with his delegation, all this food and produce, 
and they bring it to him. And Enoch comes in, this left-handed man with a dagger on his right side so he can reach and draw it. Now, why is that important? It's important because left-handed ability in war was a rare trait. A small dagger, easier to conceal. On the right side for a left-handed man, unexpected. Ehud is a unique man with a unique weapon and a unique purpose. He has gotten through the guards. He has gotten through the attendants, carrying the tribute. He comes in. As they're presenting the tribute and they're paying obeisance to the king of Moab, Ehud perhaps is looking around at the room. Yeah. Looking for the exits. Yeah. Looking where the guards are positioned. Seeing the king's disposition toward him. I'm not trying to read too much into the text. Maybe he sees the king is such a large man. Maybe he's slow. Maybe he's sluggish. He thinks about how long it takes the king to move around. Ehud gets his eyes full of the room. All the while, he's there. And his custom-made daggers on his right side. They present the tribute. They finish it. The king sends them away. But as they're going away, they go to the place called Gilgal. And there, there's a bunch of idols set up. Now, again, there's a lot of details that we don't have. It's hard to read into this. When they get to the idols, Ehud says, all right, you guys go on back. I'm going to turn around. i got to go see the king. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're the king and you've already allowed this huge procession of multiple people to come in, they present a tribute, and one lone man comes back, your guard's going to be down, right? Because if I wasn't worried and if they didn't attack me while the whole crew was there, what's one man going to do, right? Besides, I don't see any weapons on him. So he even turns around at the idols and he goes back to the king. And he says to the king, I have a secret message for you. O king, perhaps he thinks Ehud is going to reveal some plot to take his life. Maybe, king, I've got something to tell you that I couldn't tell around the whole delegation. I, I've got something you need to hear. So the king tells all of his court, silence, all of his attendants go out from his presence, and here it is, it's just Ehud and King Eglon alone in the private summer chambers. Ehud comes to him, and he gets more specific. He says, I have a message from God for you. Well, this gets the attention of the king, and he rises from his seat. Then we read that Ehud reached with his left hand, pulls the dagger from his right thigh, and he thrusts it into the stomach of this obese, gluttonous, wicked king. And then we begin to read the gory details of what happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the message here? The message is this. It doesn't matter how secure you are. It doesn't matter how well insulated you are. If God wants to lay his hand on you, God is going to do it. That's right. You see, Ehud was a unique man with a unique weapon crafted for a unique purpose at a unique time. Think of all the things that had to be calculated and planned and plotted for this assassination to go off. This wicked king who was oppressing God's people. Now, some discussion has been made about, well, is Ehud technically lying? Is he not? Well, that's where it gets even more crafty. Again, in Hebrew, there's a lot of room for wordplay. There's a lot of double entendre. There's a lot of words that have double meanings. Number one, here's this. It's track with me here. You know how we have euphemisms, like, you know, in English, you know, words that don't really... We say somebody's two-faced. We don't mean they literally have two faces. We mean they're duplicitous. So, a double, the, the euphemism in Hebrew for having a double edge is to say that the sword has two mouths. That was a Hebrew euphemism. It's a two-mouthed sword. So we already see kind of a connection between speaking and stabbing. Another thing, the word message. I have a secret message for you. It's a Hebrew word, Debar, which means word. But it's a very generic word. It can mean word or thing or matter or experience. Like, I've got something for you. If you go to somebody and say, you've got something for them. I mean, that could be anything, couldn't it? If I say, I've got a letter for you, I pull out a huge letter E and hand it to you, that's unexpected. Technically, the word play allows it. 
And then when he says, I have a message from God for you, in Hebrew, he does not use the personal name Yahweh to refer to the one true God. He uses the name Elohim, which referred to God, but it was also used in the plural to refer to other gods. So notice what he is doing here. He's not only crafted the dagger, he's not only planned his approach, he's not only done a recon on the room, but he's even crafted what he's going to say to deceive and to lull this king into being killed and slaughtered. This double mouth blade he has concealed, and he says, I have something from God for you. What Ehud said was, I have something from God for you. What Eglon heard is, I have a message from the gods for you. You see, when did Ehud turn around and come back? When he got to the idols. So the implication here is this Ehud's walking along, they get out there to the idols. And these pagan gods give Ehud a prophetic flash that Eglon needs to hear. Eglon's hearing one thing, Ehud's saying another. More importantly, Eglon's hearing one thing and God is saying another. And he says, I've got a message for you. What Eglon doesn't know is it's a nonverbal message. But he gets the point. Yeah, he does. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> he got the point on the way. There's an old song. It was originally recorded, I think, by the Honorable Quartet years ago. Johnny Cash made it famous. It says, you may run on for a long time. But sooner or later, what's God going to do? Anybody know? He's going to cut you down. You can run on for a long time, but sooner or later, God can cut you down. That song has been sung by many people. There's even used some during the, the, the civil rights movement, talk about the injustices and how God's going to catch up with these people who are doing these wrong things. There's a theme that's recurrent in Scripture, and we have to get it. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, and he sees the good, and he sees the evil. And folks, it is a biblical truth. God's going to cut you down. That's right. Despite his security, Eglon was killed by Ehud the assassin. Despite his layers of fat, the dagger was able to penetrate. Ehud it penetrated so much that his fat covered up the entire dagger. Mm -hmm. But it was just enough, wasn't it? To get the job done. You see, God knows where you are. And you cannot hide from God. You've heard the calls. Open up their phone, some number. I don't know if I should answer it or not. You open it, you answer it. What do they say? We're trying to reach you, but your car is extended warning. <laughs> no matter where you are, the people find you. <laughs> I saw a cartoon the other day, and they had a guy stranded on a desert island, and, he, and here comes this message in a bottle, and he picks it up and he opens it, and it says, We're trying to reach you, but your car is extended warning. <laughs> Those people seem to be able to find you no matter what you do. But I've got news for you. God knows exactly where you are. Yes. God knows exactly who you are. And God knows exactly how to reach you. Oh my. Now see, if you're an enemy of God, that's bad news. If you're an enemy of God, that's bad news. But if you're the people of God, that's good news. You see, think about this. Israel has been oppressed they have been in bondage, and they have been taxed and persecuted heavily under this wicked king, who mercifully, God had not destroyed that nation. So when you tell Eglon, hey, God knows where you're at, he's going to cut you down. Eglon's killing in his boots. When you look at the people of God and say, you know that man that's been oppressing you? You know that man that's been taxing you? You know that man that's been enslaving your children? The man who has dominated your land? God knows where he's at and God's going to cut him down. That's right. You see, God is a righteous God. And there are no fortifications, there are no measures that can be taken to secure one against the judgment of God. When God judges his judgment sticks. So it doesn't matter how secure you are. God can get through to you. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter how 
hard you think your heart is, God can get through you. Yes. There are a multitude of applications for this, Christian, and I don't want to go through all of them. Whether it's for judgment or salvation, God can get through to you. Nothing is too hard for God. If he can craft this assassin for a specific purpose at a specific time to do what he wants, God can accomplish his will, whether in judgment or salvation, in even the most difficult, humanly speaking, circumstances. Yes. But now I want to move on. There is no one so exalted that God cannot humble them. Oh my. Now the story gets even better. The story gets even better. This story is an, is an example probably of Israelite political satire. Now it's historical, it happened. It's being framed in such a way, you know, when you tell a story, you can omit a certain detail, right? Well, they're including the gory details in order to humiliate this man, this wicked king. Now, what did he do? Now, let's rehearse it. Yeah, you heard it right. He stabs him with a dagger. And the man is so fat, the dagger goes in, his back covers up over the blade, over the whole knife. And then, again, there's some Hebrew wordplay here. However, it comes about, a mess is made. <laughs> so, Ehud leaves and he gets out. See, he's already seen how to get out, how to lock the doors, he's gone. But then verse 24, you read sort of a, the weird rest of the story. When he had gone, the servants came. When they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited until they were embarrassed. So when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the keys and opened them. And there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Now I want you to think about this. Eglon's name means little calf. The old fat calf. Fattened up for the slaughter. I want you to think about this, folks. The mighty king of Moab for 18 years had enslaved Israel. He was the, he was the power in the area for 18 years. And look at his legacy. There are no other historical documents about Eglon, King of Moab. There's historical references to this name, and other people have this similar name. But this specific king, there's no other historical references. The records have been wiped. But now we know that he was a real king because God's word tells us that, doesn't it? The only surviving record of this man, this powerful man, this notorious man, and folks, this is God's word, is that he died shamefully in a pile of his own fat and feces. Let me tell you folks, there's no one so exalted that God cannot pull them down. There is no one so exalted that God cannot humble them. So, the story, you can kind of fill in the blanks here. The servants come and they realize the door is locked. Well, the door was locked when we left. They make an assumption. The assumption is that he's gone to the John. Why are they making that assumption? Of course, it's a reasonable assumption, giving the odor. You see, God's judgment not only took care of Eglon, it also helped facilitate Ehud's escape. And the Bible says that they just waited and said, okay, wouldn't wait on him until they were embarrassed and they finally go in to check on him and there he lays in one of the most shameful, deprecating situations you can imagine. Lord, we may go out a lot of ways. May it not be like this. But you see, what happened here is God is revealing who Eglon truly is. Now, I'm not here... We're not commenting on lifestyle or obesity. That's not what the point of this is. But he's clearly being characterized as a gluttonous, probably lazy, wicked, self-indulgent king. Because they're bringing the tribute to him right into his own chambers. Probably all sorts of food and produce. You know, bringing him in. 
huge feast on, overweight guy, sitting in his chamber, not out doing the work, not going out to war, kind of just letting the servants wait on him. Self-indulgent. And God exposes what kind of man he is. He's wicked. He's vile. And God exposes him for who he is. You see, folks, the fact of the matter is, every one of us is under the judgment of God. Yes. Without the grace of God. Thank you. And every one of us, it doesn't matter how we dress ourselves up, it doesn't matter what positions we have, every one of us is a sinner inside of the Holy God. It doesn't matter if you're a king of a world power or if you're a pauper on the street. Our sins are putrid before God. You might say, what an ignoble way for a king to die. Let me tell you something, folks, the wages of sin is death. And they that sow the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. None of us are noble in and of ourselves. Not true. There are better endings than this. But Eglon was a wicked king who had defied God, who had oppressed God's people, who had lived in indulgence and lived in gluttony and lived in sin, and he was an enemy of God. Folks, it doesn't matter how high and lofty someone is, God is able to humble them. Yes. Of all the sins that you can think of, the most noxious and, and really probably the fundamental one is pride. You read about Lucifer and his removal from heaven, it was pride. He wanted to be like God. He wanted to ascend to be like God. You look at the temptation of Adam and Eve, there's pride. If you eat of this, you'll be like God. Every time you commit a sin, do you know what it begins with? It begins with I. I want, I need, I'm going to do. Sin, by its very nature, is self-centered. Pride motivated. And God hates pride. Over and over and over, we're told again that God humbles the proud. And he resists the proud, but he lifts up the humble. Throughout Scripture, we see that God reduces the proud. Jesus says, if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven, you must enter it humbly and blessed are the poor in spirit. You see, pride stinks in the nostrils of God. Folks, God is able to humiliate and to humble those who defy him. What, is, what relevance does this have for us? It has all sorts of relevance. Number one, we know that the wicked are not always going to be in power. We know that one day Jesus Christ will stand as Lord over every power and every kingdom and every throne. But folks, it comes right down to us. The Bible has called us to walk humbly with our God. And if we live proud and we live in rebellion to God, God will humble us. We live in a day, folks, that we see, I think we're seeing now more than ever, sort of the, sort of the effects of this technology. 2015, you guys may not remember this, but in 2015, there was a, there was a leak, a data leak, by an internet, by a company called Ashley Madison. Now, if you know what that company is, I hope you know of it only secondhand. Ashley Madison is a website that explicitly their mission is to facilitate affairs for married people to hook up with other married people. 2015, they had a huge data leak. Email addresses, names, phone numbers were hacked. They were released. A lot of powerful men were all of a sudden humbled down into a pile of their own filth. Mm -hmm. Men took their lives, committed suicide because of this leak. Because God was showing the world who they truly were. Amen. Amen. Folks, there is a lie out there that what you do on the internet is private. Mm -hmm. But it is not. Your IP address, your browser history, your cookies in your browser, it is not. We're living in a 
I hate this word unprecedented. We have worn it out in the past two years. But we truly are living in unprecedented times. Anybody here ever do the Ancestry or the 23andMe stuff? Find out who you're related to. This is a very recent thing on Netflix. There's a documentary called Our Father. Anybody heard of it? Mm -hmm. by an, it's by a fertility doctor in Indiana. Oh my, yes. And some young folks began doing 23andMe and testing their DNA. And do you know what they begin to find out? That they have like 94 siblings. And it became known that this doctor had been producing children with these vulnerable women. Who would have thought that we live in a day when the average Joe can run DNA and expose so many unknown sins? But you see, God's been in this business for a long time. Whether he uses DNA evidence, whether he uses IP addresses, whether he uses data leaks, or whether he uses a skilled left-handed assassin who knows how to craft a blade just the right size and to do just the right recon to get just the right place to take just the right man down, great God Almighty is going to cut you down. That's right. Folks, if you belong to God, you're on the other side of the story. You're not Eglon. You're Israel. However, the same God that brought down Eglon raised up Eglon to punish Israel. And just because we claim allegiance to the one true God does not mean that we are exempt from him humbling us and dealing with us and disciplining us. Don't be afraid of your sin because a data leak may happen. Don't be afraid of your secret sin because your IP address might get tracked. Don't be afraid of your sin because somebody might see you at that certain place in that certain time. Don't be afraid of Ehud, be afraid of God. You might say, now Pastor, no, wait a minute. You're telling me that we should be afraid of God? Yes, I am. I sure am. I'm gonna tell you, I read the commentaries, I hear pastors say this. The Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I hear people wanna backpedal that and say, well, what it really means is kind of a healthy fatherly reverence. Yeah, but also fear. <laughs> Folks, let me tell you. The ideal parent-child relationship is this mutual love. The parent disciplines and guides the child out of love. And this child is filled. Would you tell me if this doesn't sound good? The child is filled with so much love for their parents. That, that they they could not even stomach the idea of displeasing their parents. And they always obey their parents' rules because they love their parents. Doesn't that sound like the ideal? Is that your experience? You see, I think that's the ideal. I think that's what you want to shoot for. I think that's what you want to get to. But the best child, the most well-behaved, conscientious, tender-hearted child is going to have those Lucifer moments <laughs> when they're going to make themselves like the most high. You see, parents, I don't care how much you love your little darlings. There's going to be some other impulse sometimes that's going to tempt them. And if they're going to stay in obedience and if they're going to stay safe, they're going to need a healthy dose of fear. Love keeps us going, and it should keep us going most of the time, but when love waxes cold, there has better be a healthy layer of fear to keep you afraid of what's going to happen. Let me tell you something, folks, and you can quote me on this. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's right. And the Bible tells us that the perfect love casts out all fear. Christian, the ideal relationship in your life between sin and God is you love God so much that you would rather die than sin against him. And I believe that as you grow as a Christian, you're going to spend more and more of your Christian life in that place. I hope that you do. I hope that between worship and prayer and the word, that you begin to build such a love for God, that your bread and butter is doing his will day in and day out. But Christian, do not be deceived. Temptation is going to come at times. It's going to come in such a way that your love is going to cool down to embers. And you're going to be so drawn to sin. That what you're going to need in those moments is a healthy dose 
of the fear of the Lord because it's the beginning of wisdom. Because God is not mocked. And if he'll humble an Eglon, he'll humble a ram. Not to destroy me, but to bring me back to him. Amen. Thank you. But then, there is no one so strong that God cannot overcome them. Look here in verse 26. He who escapes while all the all the stuff's going down. He who escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols, and he escaped to Sabra. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites, and did not allow anyone to pass over them. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel. And the land had rest for 80 years. So now the scene changes. We go from one-on-one espionage and assassination to outright warfare in the fields. But folks, it doesn't matter to God how he gets the job done. What matters is that God gets the job done, right? So here Ehud comes out, and he's, of course, the natural leader because of what he's done. The cream rises to the crop, and the people say, we'll follow Ehud. And so they go out. And you'll notice Ehud is a strategizer. I kind of wanted to emphasize that more, but I felt like we wanted to emphasize what God did. But Ehud strategized in the way that he dealt with Eglon, but he also strategized in the way that he deals with the armies. If you read in verse 28, they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites. Fords of the Jordan were up next to the Dead Sea. There were places where you could ford the Jordan River. The land of Moab was just on the other side. He literally got to the place where they needed to go to escape to go back home. But they couldn't. Because great God Almighty is going to cut them down. And they killed 10,000 of them. Not one man escaped. And they were all strong, able-bodied men. Now, whether it's a fast, sluggish king or whether it's a strong, sleek, able-bodied man, God can deal with him. And what you see here is this. It doesn't matter if it requires strategy, if it requires blunt force, if it requires assassination, if it requires open warfare. When God lifts up and when God pulls down, God lifts up and God pulls down. You cannot fortify yourself against the power of God. So the number of Moabites tells us there was a lot of them, 10,000. The health of the Moabites tells us they were strong men. And we read that not a single one of them escaped. When God acts, God acts. And Israel has 80 years of peace. Again, folks, depends on which side of the story you're standing on. If you're a Moabite, this is bad news. If you're an Israelite, this is a day of celebration. It's kind of like the gospel, right? It brings salvation to those who believe, but it brings a warning to those who don't believe. Now, finally, I want you to notice this. See, there's no one so secure that God cannot touch them. There's no one so exalted God can't humble them. There's no one so strong God cannot overcome them. Christian, let's put ourselves in Ehud's shoes for a minute. And let's look at this next guy that also ran. And we'll see that there is no instrument so crude that God cannot use them. Verse 31, almost as an afterthought, you've gone through this entire detailed account of what God did with Ehud and Eglon, and then it's almost as though whoever's writing Judges, oh, I forgot about Shamgar, all right? Verse 31, after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. This kind of gets him right in there at the end. Why? Why even bother? Well, number one, because whatever God does is important to tell about. This man Shemgar, we don't know anything about him. Son of Anath. Uh, Anath was a Canaanite goddess name. Uh, it could have been that he was actually was a pagan that came into Israel and God used him. We really don't know. He's a strange man that comes on the scene in a strange way and does a strange thing. But he killed 600 Philistines. We're not even talking about Philistines at this point. The Philistines come out of nowhere. So this verse leaves us with more questions than it gives us answers. So we don't have time for that. 
But what we know is this man Shamgar, whoever he is, came out of nowhere, killed 600 Philistines from whence ever they came, and he didn't do it with a dagger. He did it with an ox goad. What's an ox goad? It's a long wooden stick with a metal point on the end that farmers and herdsmen use to herd cattle. You poke them. And they used to go. A cattle prod is what it is. It's a cattle prod. Odd. And he killed 600 people with it. It's not even really meant to be a weapon. It's meant to be a tool. You see, because it doesn't matter if it's a well-crafted dagger or an ox goat. Or as we'll soon see, if it's a tent peg or jars and torches or millstones or jawbones of animals. When God decides he's going to work, he's going to work. And there's no instrument so crude that God cannot use it. Amen. On the one hand, you've got crafty Ehud. I'd, I'd love to get to know Ehud. You know, if we could just fast forward him, I'd hire him as staff. He seems a sharp guy. <laughs> Sharp guy. Yes. That one over here is. <laughs> he planned. I mean, this guy, this is this is Mission Impossible kind of stuff. He planned and he took risk. He was calculated. He gathered intel. He crafted the dagger. He crafted the plan. He crafted his statement. And then when he went and fought against the Moabites, he actually he cut them off. He had a strategy. This is a sharp guy. And I can almost imagine Ehud, maybe months in advance. You know, I don't know how long it took him to make this dagger. Let's use our imaginations. Let's say Ehud had taken tribute to Eglon before. Let's say he, he, he kind of sized him up. Okay, I see that I have so many pounds. Mm -hmm. There's so many rolls hanging off from there. And looking around, gathering. Yeah, kind of a little mental map. He goes home and Starts just cutting down the bag and see his wife. You know what you do? Oh, I'm just making making something here. What you got there? Is it gonna be cattle prod? No, no, it's a it's a knife. Okay, you're gonna use that to fillet fish? Probably not. <laughs> you got a very specific task in mind. Hmm. You see, Ehab was a man who prepared his weapon for a prepared task at a prepared time. Shamgar gets one verse. I've known people like Shamgar. I have, a, I have a relative that he is the worst for just rigging stuff up. Like, he's missing this tool and he'll just get one that's close enough. Like, he had uh, he had this uh, bobcat, you know, a little, little tractor thing, you know, with a little toilet, with a bucket on it, you know, he could do some light excavation. And he had a pin that held one of his buckets in. And, and he lost his pin. He, he grabbed a kind of big metal pin that kind of held it in place. He grabbed a huge, huge like socket wrench and it just it ruined the socket wrench. It did the job. It's like it's not how you do stuff, you know. <laughs> Duct tape and twine and bubble gum and hope it holds together. You've seen those kind of guys. It'll do in a pinch, right? Old Shamgar comes on the scene ten minutes late, half dressed, not even brushed his teeth. Sees a bunch of Philistines, grabs the closest thing to him, and starts to lay them in the shade with an ox goat. That's kind of the way I read that one single verse about this guy. He's like, oh, I got 600 Philistines. I ain't got any knives, I ain't got any swords. There, there's an ox goat. Let's see what that'll do. You ever known a Shamgar? The point is this it doesn't matter if you are a strategic, calculating assassin or you're a berserker with an ox goat. God has a place in his plan for you. God has a work for you to do. The question is this. What is in your hand? What is in your hand? You can be strategic and calculating. You can be flexible and resourceful. I think about the planning and the plotting of Ethan, and I'm reminded of our Bible smugglers. You know, we have a lot of Mission Impossible Christians today. Mm. Oh, we can't get Bibles in here. They're outlawed. We'll just, we'll just, there are different ways. I'm not going to say that. There are different ways that they get them in. 
I'm reminded of a man that I knew once, whether in the, well, in the body or out, I cannot tell. That does an international ministry under an assumed name. People he does the ministry with don't even know his real name. Right. I know a missionary friend that does that. That's a close friend of mine. I don't actually know his name. Because in order to get the gospel where it needs to go, in the way that it needs to get there, in a way that doesn't get people killed, yeah. it requires some people to think like you do. Yes. Now, Christian, God is not going to give you a knife and tell you to go stab your neighbor. But we're told in Scripture that before you leave the house, you need to take with you the sword of the Spirit, exactly. which is the Word of God. We're told in Hebrews 4, 17 that the Word of God is living and active, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and hear this, and it discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Just like Eglon was slain by the sword, was left naked and exposed in the most shameful way, the word of God, with surgical precision, does its work wherever it's in. And God said it will not return to glory. Folks, the word of God is a message of judgment. It's also a message of life. You see, the gospel brings us good news. Just like to Israel, how Enoch's dagger brought salvation. The gospel brings salvation to those who believe. But the gospel also brings with it a warning and brings with it some harsh news. That there is judgment. We're all under the sentence of judgment outside of Christ. A couple weeks ago, we went down to Louisville, Kentucky to uh, Southern Seminary's graduation. In case you didn't know it, we have many graduates that we're going to honor here soon in, in a couple of weeks. One of which is uh, Brother Bill. If you didn't know it, he recently graduated with his Master of Divinity. But that's not the point. Dr. Alan Moore, president of Southern Seminary, got up and he made this wonderful sermon at the graduation. And he's normally a very eloquent man, uh, very well spoken. But his most quotable quote of the day, he was talking about the Word of God in the book of Jeremiah. It's likened to fire and it's likened to a hammer. And he looked at the graduates that day, and Bill, he told you this, so you better just take this to heart. He said, The Word of God is a hammer, and the Word of God is a fire. So go start some fires and go break some stuff. <laughs> Christian, let me tell you, the word of God is destructive and it is constructive. God told Jeremiah, I'm sending you out to tear down and to build up, to pluck up and to plant. Mm -hmm. Paul tells Timothy, reprove, rebuke, and exhort. You see, in order for people to be built up, they have to be broken down. For our hearts to be full of the Holy Spirit, they have to be emptied of what's in them. For us to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must be humble as a little child. And the word of God comes to us. It shows us our sin. It shows us that which brings us under the judgment of God. That which without repentance makes us just like Eglon. And with surgical precision, it begins to remove. Christian, use the word of God. And it doesn't matter how crude. The word is powerful. Whether it's in the hand of Shamgar or whether it's in the hand of Ehud. The word does the work. God does the work. So here, live in humility before God who sees everything and judges righteously. Kill pride which causes us to live without dependence on God. Don't be like Eglon. Recognize God as a source of your strength and victories. Not your own skill, not your own cunning, but God gives the battle. Notice that he does. As cunning as he was, he just said it's the Lord that's given them into our hands. And Christians, submit to the will of God. And submit to the service of God. Because whether you're a Shamgar or whether you're an Ehud, there is work to do. And God has placed something yes. in your hands. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is true. Lord, I thank you that your eyes see everything. You judge. You exalt. You humble. You overcome. And God, it's all from you. But Father, may we be found in your hand as your instrument. Utilizing the instruments you've given us for your glory. 
We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a few announcements, so I'm just going to ask that everyone who's making an announcement to come up here. Um, first one up is to start. Uh, but I will say this is a very big man note. Uh, our church work day, which we had to move around, we moved it to June 11th. So uh, see James Berry uh, about our, there he is. Uh, stand up, James, if people don't know you. There's James Berry. He's our building and grounds guy. So if you ever have a question about the building, somebody asked me the other day, hey, where's, where's this at? I don't know. I take care of that. I just, you know, that's James. Uh, but he'll be leading the work day on June 11th. If you want to be a part of that, we encourage you to. We've got a lot of projects. And then I'm going to let you guys go like dominoes and sequential order. Sarah, let's start us off. Okay. Uh, speaking of graduates, we are going to resume our um, graduation ceremony here at the church. It's going to be the first Sunday in June. So if you have a senior or if you're a high school senior, if you are graduating college um, with any type of degree, or if you are graduating some kind of work training certification program, so tech schools are included in this as well, um, please come see me and make sure that we have your information. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to recognize our graduates on stage. We're going to give them an opportunity just to tell where they graduated from, what they graduated with, what their plans are, and how the church can be praying for them. And then afterwards, we're going to have a small reception for them in the back. Just cake and punch. It'll be really quick just so everybody can get to celebrate with them and acknowledge their achievements. So um, if you have seniors or graduates, please come see me and make sure I have your information. Fast to talk about work day, a lot of new things coming in the building. So we bring new things in, you gotta take old things out. So I am the garage sale guy today. What we have, first come, first serve, if you just get out of the building, office chairs, the little red office chairs, they have wheels, wheels work. These are deluxe models, they spin clockwise and counterclockwise. Nobody got that joke, okay. But we got about five of them back here in room 104, if you want one. Pick one up, put it in your car, take it with you. If you have a huge house, we have a 10 foot long, one piece conference table that we're trying to get rid of. We've tried selling it. Nobody wants it, they ask about it, does it come apart? No, it's one solid piece. If you have a use for that in a barn or whatever, um, come see us, you can get that as well. We also have that old Keurig coffee maker that works like 80% of the time. <laughs> Come see me about it. I'll show you what works and what doesn't work. You can take that. If for some reason you want an old pew, if you go to the gym, it's full of old pews. Um, if you get like trails, I might get taken out because they're big. We're trying to get this stuff out of the building. If it does not find a home very soon, we have a small metal container in the back of the building that they will all go into called a dumpster. And if you have time this week, and you have a chainsaw, a reciprocating saw, and you want to do a little stress relief, talk to me, and we will be taking some of these extra pews out from the gym and cutting them into pieces and throwing them in a dumpster because they've got to go. Because as the new stuff comes in, we've got to make room to get the old stuff out. All right. So right after church, Youth Arena, we're going to have, we have cards for all the teachers at Ben's Elementary School. And if we have everybody help fill out these little cards, say, you know, hey, I thank for being a teacher. Our women's ministries have gifts for each of the teachers. So help fill out the cards, saying thank you cards for being of service. Uh, it goes to Ben's Elementary, it's an outreach event. The other thing we've had in the last couple of weeks in the bulletin was uh, if you'd signed up, for a spaghetti dinner, we'd had a spaghetti dinner at the church. Well, seeing how two people signed up, we're not having a spaghetti dinner at the church. But if you still want to talk about the things that you want to do, or help do, or plan, or brainstorm for the summer events, for example, in a month is a bean dinner at Westgate Park, I want to go there and evangelize. That's how, whatever we want to do. So see now it's after COVID, things could change. If you have an idea that you want to do, let's bring it to the table. So we're also going to have other summer ministries we're going to talk about also. So we're going to do that at McAllister's Valley in Hilliard. 
They share the building with Starbucks right in front of Meyer. She'll find you. So as I said, Starbucks, you want to write. So if you want to be a part of that, this planning, or if you have something that you want to do that the Lord's needing you to do, uh, bring it to the table and we'll help you make it happen. So right at the church, go help fill out cards. To help us evangelize. And then let's do some evangelistic planning afterwards and, and get something to eat. All right. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. So we got some amazing uh, evangelistic opportunities. We've got the theme dinner, and we've got a, a block party that we're planning for later in June. And so if you're interested in being a part of that, we'd love to have you come and learn about how you can be a part and uh, help us at Briggs Road evangelize and share the gospel in our community using that two-edged dagger that the Lord has given us. Amen. All right. And with that, I believe that's everyone. So I will say that you are sent. Have a blessed day. Amen.